What's going on y'all? It's Cone back here again today with another video. We are now two days into the NBA season and 28 out of the 30 teams have played their first regular season game. The only two teams that haven't done so are the Bucks and the Sixers who play tonight as I'm uploading this video against each other, which should be a really fun matchup. Dame, of course, debuting for the Bucks, facing off against the Sixers who are in the midst of the whole James Harden turmoil. But beyond those two teams, everyone else has played. So I thought I would go ahead and give you one takeaway from every single team's first game in this season. Some of them might be overreactions. I'm going to try not to get too crazy, but I thought I'd just give my thoughts on every single team in this video so everybody gets a little bit of love. I'm going to do an alphabetical order starting with the Atlanta Hawks and going to the Washington Wizards. I'll hopefully also have chapters on this video so you can scroll to see where your favorite team is at and figure out what I have to say about them. Uh, but yeah, leave a like and subscribe if you enjoy. Tell me what your biggest takeaway was from your favorite team through their first game. Let's go ahead and get into it. Like I said, we're starting off with the Atlanta Hawks and for them, my big takeaway from game one is that Jalen Johnson's going to be really big for this team. He was a lot of people's big breakout candidate for the Hawks going into the season and in game one, he was amazing. He put up 21 points, seven boards, two assists, two steals, and a block in 29 minutes. Also shot nine of 13, played some solid defense. Jalen Johnson was incredible. They need somebody to step up for this team, be a consistent guy at the wing position. Jalen Johnson feels like he could be that piece. Again, a lot of people thought he could be a breakout player coming into the season, looked great towards the end of last year under Quinn Snyder. It feels like he's gonna have a significant role. I'm really excited to see what he can do. And in a game where most players on the Hawks really struggled, Trey Young couldn't score, DeJounte Murray was really inefficient and the Hawks ended up losing to the Hornets. Jalen Johnson was one steadying presence and a bright spot and hopefully he will continue to be so going forward. For the Boston Celtics, the big takeaway is that Kristaps Porzingis is going to be ridiculous this season. He makes everything so much easier for this Boston team. In their first game, which was a win over the Knicks in the Garden, he puts up 30 points, which is the most points ever by a Celtic in their debut. Pretty sure that's a stat I read. If it's wrong, whatever. But put up 30 points to go with eight boards. He had four blocks, eight of 15 shooting. He opened up the game a lot for Jason Tatum too. The two of them ran an amazing pick and roll consistently with each other. Also pick and pop, which it's hard to guard. It's weird when you imagine a four and a five running those types of sets, but they make it work super well. Tatum looked more aggressive and better at finishing at the basket than maybe he ever has in this first game. Porzingis was knocking down deep threes, was amazing blocking shots around the rim, looking like like a huge defensive force. Again, I don't think a lot of people realized how good Porzingis was last season. They're gonna learn with him now being in a bigger market and a better team in Boston. He was great in his first game, and I think that's gonna continue to be the case as long as he stays healthy. My takeaway for the Nets is that Cam Thomas has to continue to get consistent minutes. He was amazing in this first game for the Nets easily their best player. He puts up 36 points, three boards, two assists on 13 of 21 shooting, played a decent number of minutes, although Jacques Vaughn did take him out in a middle section of the fourth quarter, which didn't make a lot of sense to me. I understand you want to go to your starter in Spencer Dinwiddie, but ride the hot hand. A guy who's putting up nearly 40 points, you got to keep him in there and see what he can do. He did get in towards the end of the game, got the game-winning shot attempt, which didn't go down, but he was deserving of that look the way that he played. This is a team that needs guys that can get you buckets, Cam Thomas can do exactly that. He has to stay as a consistent part of this rotation. We saw last year where Cam Thomas had a couple of huge scoring games and then slowly faded out of the rotation. I understand he's not the best defender in the world, but you've got a lot of those. Let Cam Thomas play. For the Charlotte Hornets, my takeaway was that Mark Williams is a game changer. He was one of my big breakout candidates coming into the season when I made that one breakout candidate for every team video. Mark Williams was my pick for the Charlotte Hornets. And in this game, he was incredible. 13 points, 15 rebounds bounds, one assist, three steals and a block, great defense all around, being a lob threat for LaMelo Ball, just being a great presence at the big man position, which this Hornets team really hasn't had over the past few years. Finally, they got someone who feels stable at that spot, who feels like he fits the exact role that they're looking for. I think Mark Williams is going to become a stud before long, and this game is a great example of what he can do, how he can impact the game, and really just elevate this Hornets squad. For the Chicago Bulls, my takeaway is that I don't think this thing is going to last very long. They got absolutely destroyed by the Thunder tonight, lost by 20 points at home in a game where the Thunder had a bunch of turnovers towards the beginning, were missing some key pieces. The Bulls just couldn't seem to put it together. It's the first game of the season. I don't think they should blow it up right away or anything, but it's clear that this team has some work to do. And after the game, they already had a players meeting. They were getting heated. There was conflict, which is good, I guess, that they're showing some sense of urgency, but I just don't think this Bulls team is going to be very good this season. I could see this really building up with some rumors in the offseason too. I'm just 
At this point, I'm expecting one of DeRozan, Levine, or even both of them to be gone at some point during this season. For the Cavs, my takeaway is that Max Schroes is going to be such a perfect fit for this squad. He was amazing in his debut, putting up 27 points, 12 boards, 2 assists, hitting 7 threes. Unbelievable. This is the exact type of player they're hoping they would get with signing Max Struess. He delivered in the first game. They need that consistent scoring option alongside Donovan Mitchell, alongside Darius Garland, who can spread the floor, play some solid defense. It's exactly what he did tonight. He was amazing in that role. Going to be even more important when Jared Allen comes back from injury. Struess was a great pickup. I loved it in the offseason. I love it even more now that he played this first game. He's going to be great for them. For Dallas, my big takeaway is that Derek Lively has to be the starter and have a significant role on this team. Tonight, he came off the bench. They instead started Maxi Kleba at the big man spot against the Spurs, and they looked really bad. Their defense was awful in the first quarter, and it really was never fantastic throughout the night, but it was drastically better when Derek Lively was out there. And also, the offense improved drastically when he was out there too, giving Luka that lob threat, a guy who can go up and grab some boards, just be that athletic big. That's something that the Mavericks have really needed for a while, and Derek Lively fills that role. Tonight, he had a 16-10 and double-double in his NBA debut with seven of eight shooting, and he had a team high plus 20 on the game. He was great. They need more Derek Lively. He's got to start for this team, or at the very least, play a majority of the center minutes if they want to be successful. Loved how he looked in this game. He could be huge for them all throughout the year. For the Nuggets, my takeaway is that they're still the best team in the West. I don't think anybody's surprised by that. They're the reigning champions. I picked them to win the West again. And in that first game against the Lakers, everything they did just reinforced that belief. Jokic is still the best player in the world. He was dominant against Anthony Davis. Jamal Murray looks like he's in for the best year of his career. Aaron Gordon was amazing. Michael Porter Jr. didn't score well, but I liked his impact in other areas. KCP is great. One of the best starting lineups in the entire league. Bench was a bit shaky, but I like some of the production they got, and I think it'll get better over time. Really just the Nuggets reinforced the fact that, yeah, they're my favorites in the West. For the Pistons, my takeaway is that Cade Cunningham is ready to have that big year people have been looking for. In this first game against the Miami Heat, he puts up 30 points, 3 rebounds, and 9 assists, shoots 4 of 9 from deep, 13 of 27 from the field. It was a lot of shots. 27 shots to score 30 points isn't amazing, but he wasn't getting a lot of love in terms of free throws. I do want to see him seek out contact a bit more, try and get to the line, which will come with time. That's an area of scoring that most great scores develop. I'm confident Cade will eventually, but putting up 30 points, three boards, nine assists in your first game going up against a really tough Heat team is really impressive. They need Cade to become this all-star player, take that leap if they want to make that play and push and continue to rise up the standings. Through the first game, it seems like Cade might be ready to take the jump. For the Warriors, my takeaway is that Chris Paul is going to be really helpful for this team. They ended up losing their first game against the Suns, but it was close, and I liked a lot of what I saw from CP3. The shooting was rough, but I don't think it'll be that bad again. And specifically in the third quarter when Steph Kerr was out for part of it, the Warriors not only held the lead, but they continued to build on it. They continued to outscore the Suns drastically in that third quarter. A lot of it with Steph Curry off the court. Some of it was with Steph Curry, and I did like how CP3 and Steph played alongside each other. I thought Steph was great off ball, which is no surprise. Steph's maybe the greatest off ball mover of all time. Time. I like the look of it. It wasn't perfect by any means, and they did lose the game, but I thought it was really promising what we did see. For the Rockets, the big takeaway is that this thing's going to take some time. They got destroyed by the Orlando Magic in the first game with this new look team. Nobody played phenomenally. Dylan Brooks was probably their best player, shot decently efficiently, played some great defense on Paolo Bancaro getting that assignment, but beyond that, nothing too insane. Uh, Shengun was also good, but Jalen Green really struggled. Fred Van Vliet struggled. Amon Thompson had a really rough game. Basically, Basically, everybody out there in the court outside of Brooks and Shengun didn't play super well. The offense was really clunky. They weren't able to knock down shots. Everything looked a bit mismatched. The defense was rough as well. It's going to take time. This is a team with a lot of moving pieces, a really young team still too, in a really tough NBA. And the Magic, I think, are going to be really solid this season. So it's not like there's some terrible team. Obviously, I'm sure Rockets fans are impatient after a couple years of really struggling, but it's going to take some time. I'm still confident the Rockets will be a great bit better than they were last season. Even if the win total isn't drastically better, I think the on-court product will eventually be much improved. It's just going to take a little bit for the pieces to gel. For the Pacers, my takeaway is that this team may be ready to take that leap. All offseason, I've been saying that in the Eastern Conference, I'm keeping an eye on the Pacers to be not only a really fun team to watch, but a team that could take a massive jump up the standings. And through the first game, I was really impressed. Now, they were playing the Wizards, who aren't the best competition in the world, but even still, I love the play style in particular. They were aggressive, fast-paced, running in transition, gunning, knocking down threes. 
They were doing everything that I want to see from this team. It's perfect for their personnel. Tyrese put up 20 points, dishing out 11 dimes. Bruce Brown had 24 points, hit six threes, 18 from Matherin, 12 and 10 from Nemhard. You got great play from Buddy Heel knocking down shots off the bench. Obi Toppin looked good in his first game. Everything was fun. This offense is going to be a blast to watch this entire season. I'm excited to watch the Pacers continuously blitz teams, run in transition, and take advantage of the talent that they have. And if they do so while playing decent enough defense, the Pacers could be really fun, not just in terms of entertainment, but also in terms of knocking off a couple teams that a lot of people think might be better than them in the East this year. For the Clippers, my big takeaway is that Russell Westbrook looked great. In this game, he put up 11 points, five boards, 13 assists, shot five of eight, was really in control, one of two from three, and overall, he was a team high plus 30 on the game. He was also looking really good athletically. He threw down a number of dunks, some really aggressive ones, some ones that were somewhat reminiscent of the Russ of old where he was destroying rims. It was really good to see. If they're getting this version of Russ the entire year, which we saw some of towards the end of last year when he joined the Clippers, it's going to be big for them. The team looks way better with Russ out there than it did the first half of last season without him. Kawhi looked good. Paul George looked good. Really, everyone on this Clippers team was pretty good tonight. They destroyed a Blazers team that really had no chance. The Clippers look really ready to make a push out there in the Western Conference. We'll see if they stay healthy, but if they do and keep getting this kind of play from Russ, the Clippers are scary. For the Lakers, my takeaway is that Anthony Davis might be more important than ever. This Lakers team, I still believe, is pretty good. But when Anthony Davis goes really cold in the second half like he did last game against the Nuggets and doesn't score a single point, they completely fall apart, especially because it seems like LeBron James is going to be somewhat load managed throughout this season. Darvin Ham said after the game when LeBron only played 29 minutes and they subbed him out at a really critical time in the game that they're going to keep an eye on his minutes and keep him right around that mark for a majority of the regular season if possible. I do believe if they start losing games, they'll kind of switch that up. But if that's the plan going forward, they need the most out of Anthony Davis. He has to be aggressive, take the torch as the best player in this team. We've been waiting for him to do it for a while. We'll see if he can do it. And if not, the Lakers are in a bit of trouble. For Memphis, my big takeaway is that this team's in a lot of trouble without John Morant. In the past, they've been able to stay afloat without job, but that was when they had Tyus Jones. And also, it was when this team wasn't completely decimated by injuries. Since the last time we talked about the Grizzlies in my season predictions video, Steven Adams got ruled out for the season. He is really big for this team, not just defensively grabbing boards and closing up possessions, but also offensively getting them offensive boards, creating second chance opportunities, and specifically setting screens for guys. Even when Jock comes back, Adams is a massive loss. Plus, Brandon Clark isn't playing. We don't know when he's going to be back. Still no timetable from his injury at the end of last season. I think Luke Kennard even suffered a head injury towards the end of this game too. We'll see if that keeps him out for some time. This team is decimated at this point. Desmond Bain looked great tonight. He put up 30 points. He was doing the best that he could. I still believe Bain could be in all sort of conversations throughout this season. But beyond him, not much else was going on. Jaron really struggled offensively. It just feels like this team is not nearly well equipped as it's been in the past to compete without John Morant. So over those first 25 games, this thing could turn into a mess. My takeaway for the Heat is that this team is still a walking heart attack. Last season, if you didn't know, I'm sure Heat fans do, this team was pretty much always in clutch games in the regular season. They were either having a big lead and then blowing it or being down by a bit and catching up. Every game was really, really stressful. And again, that was the case tonight against a Pistons team, which was dealing with some significant injuries. They were up double digits on them in the fourth quarter and then completely collapsed to the point where the Pistons had a look at the end of the game to try and take this one, hit a game winner, but the Heat managed to close it off, win this one just barely. A win is a win, it really doesn't matter, but the Heat continue to give their fans heart attacks, and it was for a number of reasons. A couple guys struggled tonight. Kyle Lowry went 0 of 1 shooting, was kind of just doing cardio out there, but they get the win in typical Heat fashion, even if it is incredibly stressful. For the Timberwolves, my big takeaway is that the offense still looks really clunky out there. Last season, they had a lot of problems with some bad decision making, tunnel vision, just bad overall shot making. That seemed to be a similar case tonight, at least to start the season. Part of it was amazing defense from the Raptors, who we'll talk about later, but the Timberwolves also just kind of fell into iso ball pretty consistently. Cat shot 8 of 25, Ant shot 8 of 27 after starting the game as the only guy that could score on this team. They desperately missed the spacing of Jaden McDaniels, who didn't play in this one, and I think once he comes back, he'll help a lot, but I do still worry about the Wolves being consistently able to score because everything just feels more difficult than it should be for them. For the Pelicans, my big takeaway is that Zion Williamson is still ridiculous. 
when he's healthy in my opinion he's a top 15 ish player in the world and in this game he showcased a lot of that he was slow to start off but by the end of the game finishes with 23 points seven boards three assists nine of 17 shooting and it wasn't just that he was dunking on guys he dunked on jaron jackson jr i think he also dunked on xavier tillman he was aggressive the athleticism is ridiculous just some amazing plays out there for the pelicans he's a force if he can stay healthy this pelicans team is so much more dangerous it's just a matter of if he actually can for the knicks my takeaway is that this team still can't seem to hit free throws it is only one game maybe it'll be better as they go on but last season they're a bottom 10 team in free throw shooting which hurt them a lot and tonight against the celtics at home in a game where they had a chance to win despite jalen brunson really struggling and same thing with julius randall they shot 54 percent from the line missing a lot of really critical free throws down the stretch and just all throughout the night They've got to be better in that regard because, again, they had a chance to win this despite playing a pretty poor game all around. If you can just hit your free throws, they could have stolen this one from a really good Celtics team. Instead, they fall to 0-1. Not the end of the world, but it is a problem that seems to be popping up again. For my OKC Thunder, my takeaway is that Shea is taking another leap this season. In the first game out there against the Bulls, after a lot of people called him overrated in the offseason, Shea puts up 31 points, 5 boards, 10 assists, playing amazing defense with a steal and a block, while shooting 12 of 18 from the field and knocking down a few threes. He was incredible out there, doing his typical mid-range dominance, finishing out around the rim in impossible ways, but the three-point shooting was huge. He was knocking them down comfortably in rhythm. That's exactly what you want to see after a bit of a down season in both terms of volume and efficiency from him in the three-point department. If he keeps getting that up, I don't know what you do about Shea. The playmaking was the best I've ever seen at making some passes that he typically wouldn't make in the past, but tonight he was locked in finding guys. Shooters were actually knocking down shots, which is huge for this team. The defense looked the best it's ever been. Shea just continues to level up, and if he continues to play this way and the Thunder take a jump, don't sleep on him as the potential MVP of the season. For the Magic, my takeaway is that their bench looks pretty nice. Their starting lineup has a bunch of talent in it between Franz and Paolo, who each had decent games. Paolo didn't shoot very much tonight, but all around, I thought he was perfectly fine, made some good plays outside of scoring. But really, the highlight of this game for the Magic was their bench. They got 20 points, 8 rebounds, and 2 assists from Cole Anthony, 11 points from Gary Harris, 4 boards and 5 dimes from Joe Ingles, 11 points from Jonathan Isaac, who looked really solid in this game. I didn't know if we were ever going to see good, consistent play from Isaac again after all the injuries, but this one, he looked good. He was playing really solid defense again, including a massive block on Jalen Green. If the Magic have this level of depth, a play and run certainly isn't out of the question for them. For the Phoenix Suns, the takeaway is that D-Book is in for the best year of his entire career. In that first game against the Warriors, they needed him to step up with Kevin Durant struggling with no Bradley Beal. The Warriors were going on that massive third quarter run. They needed somebody to stop the bleeding. And that was D-Book, both through his scoring and especially through his playmaking. They're looking for someone to be that lead playmaker this season. Book feels like that guy and in that first game. He played that role to perfection. If he continues to do that while playing the defense that has been consistently underrated over the past few years, Book becomes one of the most well-rounded players in the league, and I could even see him falling into some MVP talks if he has to play some time without, say, Katie or Bradley Beal for a majority of the season. For the Blazers, my takeaway is that Malcolm Brogdon is going to be a big trade asset for them this season. It wasn't a lot of positives in this game for the Blazers. They got demolished by a Clippers team that looks really good and the Blazers are heading into a new era. They're rebuilding. So it's not the end of the world. Losses are probably what they should be going for. But one positive was Brogdon. He put up 20 points, two boards, five assists, efficient scoring. He looked good out there. Looked like his sixth man of the year self from last season. If he continues to play like this, I think a lot of teams are going to look at him as a trade target. And maybe the Blazers could get a good haul from continuing to build up this pool of assets that they're trying to accrue over in Portland to head into the this new era. For the Kings, my takeaway is that their new under the radar additions looked really good. They didn't make any big splashy moves in the offseason like people thought they could, maybe by trading Harrison Barnes' contract, for example, which Harrison Barnes was absurd tonight. He had 30 points, was efficiently scoring. It feels like Harrison Barnes does this at the beginning of every season, but he was amazing. But beyond him, their new additions really showed out. JaVale McGee, eight points on four, four shooting with some really solid defense. Sasha Vezinkov with eight points and two steals on three of six shooting. Chris Duarte with nine points on three of five shooting. A bunch of smaller contributions across the board from some more under the radar pickups, but I liked a lot of what I saw. The Kings through this first game feel deeper and that could be big for them this season. For the Spurs, my takeaway is that the world is about to learn just how good Devin Vassell really is. 
They haven't gotten a lot of viewership over the past few years because they've been bad, they've been rebuilding. But now that they've got Vic, who was decent in his rookie debut, dealt with a lot of foul trouble, which kept him off the court for majority of the game when he came in at the end, he was amazing. But for the most part, really the highlight of this game was the play of Devin Vassell. He put up 23 points, five boards, three assists, two steals, nine of 17 shooting. The mid-range scoring specifically is ridiculous with him. He's gonna be huge for the Spurs team going forward, a critical piece of this young core. Loved what I saw from him. He's been doing this over the past few years. And I think a lot of people are gonna learn that, hey, this Vassell guy is really good. For the Raptors, my takeaway is that this defense could be ridiculous this season. Last year, it feels like they took a big step back defensively. They weren't this incredibly lengthy and frustrating team like they were the year before. And through the first game, it feels like they might have some of that identity back. Scotty Barnes and OJ Anobi in particular were incredible defensively on Anthony Edwards and pretty much everybody on that Timberwolves team. They gave them a lot of trouble, forced them into bad shots. Scotty Barnes had, I think, five blocks out there. Just really impressive defensive game from this team. Hopefully we see more of that because the Raptors are way more fun when they're actually buying in on that end. For the Jazz, my takeaway is that guard play is going to be a bit of a question mark for them throughout this season. Jordan Clarkson was good tonight. He had 24 points and six assists. But beyond him, they didn't get anything too crazy. Talon Horton Tucker really struggled. Sexton was awful in this game. Chris Dunn wasn't great. Keontae George was solid, but didn't play a ton. They've got to figure out who are the guards for this team going forward. Who's going to give them the best chance to succeed? And they've got to figure it out quick because last year after losing Mike Conley, they really struggled to get consistent backcourt play and it really hurt them. For through this first game, we saw a bit of that again. They just could not consistently get things going. The offense seemed a bit disjointed. I think if they figure out who is the lead guard and who fits better, best in that role going forward, it'll help. But the question is, when do they figure that out? And finally, for the Washington Wizards, my takeaway was that Tyus Jones is going to be really good in this role for the Wizards. In his first game as the starting point guard, put up 16 points, three boards, six assists, one steal, and a block on six of 12 shooting. Started off really hot, cooled off as the game went on. They ended up getting blown out, so there wasn't too much for him to actually do. But I liked what I saw. I mean, Tyus Jones has been talked about as a guy that could really succeed in a starting role if he's just given one. And in this first game, I was impressed. I'm not expecting a lot of wins from this Wizards team. They're a young rebuilding team that's trying to find their identity. But through the first game, I liked what I saw from Tyus Jones. Happy that he's getting this opportunity. With that being said, those are my takeaways from every team's first NBA game this season. Let me know what your thoughts are in my takeaways down below. Also, give me one of your own if you've got a different one from what I have for your favorite team. Let me know how you think your team's going to do this season. Again, if you're a Bucks or a Sixers fan, they haven't played yet as I'm recording this video. So, I'll talk about probably their matchup against each other specifically in my next video following this one. So go check that out if you want to see my talk about them. But yeah, appreciate y'all watching. Leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed. Hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on future videos. I'll see y'all later. Real one, say it back.